Well, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, uh, I don't represent in any way uh, our government, which tends to be Eurosceptic. I am the, uh, the, I've been deemed a Europhil many times by our prime ministers, and this is not so difficult in comparison with my other Czech, uh, let's say, colleagues and, and fellow sufferers. But, um, uh, you know, when this is, this is an interesting thing. It used to be an American crisis uh, in the beginnings. So we thought we would never catch it. There was this great debate, if you, if, you, if you remember, about a storm in a teacup and about this great decoupling where it is no longer true that when America sneezes, the whole world catches the cold. And um, We even used the word um, schadenfreude, which is, which is a word that doesn't exist in English, which also says that's a very big compliment. For, it means uh, that you're happy when somebody else is doing poorly. Uh, so we used, or the economists has used that word quite often. In Czech language, I think we have six synonyms for the word um, <laughs> schadenfreude. So that speaks, I think, uh, also something about the, uh, about the way people, people think. Uh, well, then we caught the crisis, and now suddenly we, uh, the reaction of Europeans has been completely different to that reaction which we saw in the United States of America. Uh, firstly, nobody came up with the idea that the common currency called dollar should be abolished and that it is to be blamed for the American crisis. And in fact, when California was in a sort of a quasi-bankruptcy situation, not unsimilar to what many countries in Europe face, nobody came up with the idea that the best help that we could, or that Americans could offer to California would be to, to invite it to leave the, uh, the, the dollar zone. This is laughable, and, uh, but it is very similar to, to sort of the... Uh, the conclusion that we Europeans uh, came up with. This is a fiscal problem, not a monetary problem. To try to solve a, f a fiscal problem by monetary means is possible, of course, but it is like trying to solve a hardware problem with software upgrades or a software problem with hardware upgrades. It is simply slightly, uh, slightly um, <coughs> complicated and um, in a, inappropriate. Now, this whole debate on, on devaluation, again, becoming the sort of a silver bullet that should solve all problems, um, usually comes from economists who know very well that there's nothing like um, a free lunch. Now, if I remember well, the first countries to catch the cold were not uh, countries that used the euro, and um, you know, Hungary nor Iceland could devaluate their way out of the bankruptcy. So Hungary, uh, you know, went through bankruptcy or quasi-bankruptcy, however you want to you want to call it, even though their currency was 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 perfectly floating and they could have devaluated it. Um, I have the same debate with my Czech friends uh, from the National Bank, who tend to be very strong advocates of um, not joining the euro and blaming euro for for the crisis. Uh, always telling them, well, why don't you devaluate? the Czech crown to half of its value vis-a-vis -vis euro and that would cost us nothing and we would you know export um, like, like, like crazy uh, and the reply I always get well you know it's not so easy uh, and that's exactly what it is. You know, monetary policy uh, like fiscal policy are, are, are basically tricks. We should never forget that um, there's something that works perhaps in the short run never works in the long run. Fiscal, po fiscal policy, expansionary fiscal policy is basically trying to pretend that there is demand while there is no demand. So when the markets are weak to consume, and this is absolutely normative, I mean who is there to say what level of consumption or what level of GDP growth is exactly appropriate and when the government should or shouldn't step in. Um, so when the, government, when the markets are weak, the government steps in and pretends that there is uh, a certain level of demand under the discretion, of course, um, of the politician, him or herself, what level of demand he or she deems appropriate. Um, uh, so monetary policy is, of course, trying to pretend that there is liquidity when there is no liquidity. And this trick works for, for a little while, but never for a long while. Now let's just do a little thought experiment and let's just try and imagine what would happen to Europe if we would not have Euro at all? Would the crises avoid us? I don't think anybody would sort of claim that. We would have the same crises. Uh, uh, and I would even claim that the crisis would be much more severe and much more harsher because added to all the problems that we are facing already, we would have problems with, um, uh, with currency and instability. We would have 
problems with inflation, and we would have problems with, <coughs> with um, of course, mutual devaluations. So these you know vicious circles that run to zero. Um, devaluation does not, properly speaking, increase the competition of that given country. It decreases the competition of your business partner. So you're merely exporting your problems abroad, and you can do devaluation, which is something that we've done, especially the Slovaks in the early 90s. You can do this if your surrounding, let's say, economies are growing very strongly. So when you're lying low, you can sort of, you know, throw a throw a line, but the surrounding horses must be strong enough to pull you out of the ditch which is not exactly the situation uh, that we are uh, facing right now. Uh, <clears throat> it would be what it was before we adopted Euro in Europe, that, of course, Germany and its, and its Bundesbank would be setting the tone and everybody else would be following their, uh, their uh, uh, exchange rate, pegging their currencies in a softer or harder way to the Deutsch, Deutschmark but having no say whatsoever. in uh, So Germany would have even much more stronger control of the monetary issues in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Now let's try to make one other thought experiment, perhaps even a little, little graver than, than this one. And let's try and imagine that politicians not only have almost absolute discretion over fiscal policy, as they do now, more or less, but that they would also have discretion over monetary policy. Because monetary and fiscal policy are very different. Monetary policy is, and I know I'm simplifying, but for the sake of this debate, this should suffice. Monetary policy is the monopoly of the government to print money. Fiscal policy is very different. Fiscal policy is the monopoly of the government to print debt. But otherwise, at the end of the day, the game is, is, is very similar. So now we have one hand tied behind our backs. Politicians can know cannot freely print money as they see fit. Just imagine how would we look like if they could. In other words, they wouldn't tackle the, the, the problem just with printing debt, but on addition to it, they would be printing, printing money. We've had this situation a couple of times, and we all acknowledge that monetary policy is much better off if politicians or the logic of politics um, does not give them the authority to print money as they, as they see fit. Because the logic of politics is, is of course, different from, from the logic of, of, um, of, of the economy. So, the debate today is, I think, this is the allegory that I like to use, either we set both hands free, start dismantling, uh, start dismantling the common currency, whose biggest advantage, of course, is that it is common, if, it, you know, it's... Um, two, three, four currencies, that's the whole idea vanishes into thin air. It would be very, uh, very, I would say, naive to think that Europe can be globally competitive with up to 27 different currencies. Um, so, either we let the monetary hand loose again, which is something that we've already done, we've been there, we have the t-shirt, uh, some a situation that we've already uh, walked through from, for many years. Or we do what we did to monetary policy also with fiscal policy. In other words, we should confiscate fiscal policy, leaving every country to do whatever they want to do in terms of taxing and, and social, but being uh, actually confiscating, to use a strong word, uh, the whole possibility of a government to go to markets to, 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 to borrow money. What, I mean, what, what do I mean? Well, you can choose a nation should be absolutely 100% free to choose a low taxation, such as your case, when it comes to corporate taxing. And, well, let's use America. It's always easier to use a country that's not here. Um, <laughs> low taxes, low, uh, let's say, quality of public service. Or high taxes and high quality uh, of public service, such as the case in, in, in the North. But what should not be allowed is this um, fiscal schizophrenia, so to speak, when we believe in small governments when it comes to taxes, but in huge government when it comes to expen expenditure. That is something that should not be allowed. And we should make sure that, like a government that collects too little money 
on its revenues and then wants to spend more on you know churches and schools and 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 pensions and learn they're all very good things of course today they cannot print that money because they simply need need more of it but they can print print debt so the only way forward in my thinking would be to leave each country's um, choice of uh, let's say I like to speak more on the quality of taxes rather than high or low taxes. When you go to a supermarket, you don't buy the cheapest shampoo that you see. You buy exactly the shampoo where you believe the quality is, uh, refle- is sort of um, 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 correspondent to, to the price. So um, that, I think, is something that we should, uh, we should debate and move, move forward. In the same way that we have confiscated monetary policy from the hands of the politicians, and it is better. So we should also think about doing that um, when, it comes to, when it comes to fiscal policy. That was my first point. In the remaining time, <clears throat> I would like to um, tackle the issue of, of, let's say, austerity, which I believe is also very um, uh, alive here in Ireland as it is in, in my home country. I think there's a, there's a misdiagnosis when it comes to the body of economics. We start using medical terminology and we claim that the economy, uh, that the economy is, is depressed. That, I think, is a crucial and fundamental misdiagnosis uh, from which uh, an ill treatment then arises. Um, the economy is not depressed. Uh, the economy is manic depressed. And, and this is a very good country to, to speak of that. If you have a manic depressed patient, you must not give him or her just the antidepressants, which is budget deficits to translate it into, into economics. Uh, when a depressed patient regains his or her life energies and mood, let's say, this is good news. If the same process happens to a manic depressed patient, this is not good news. And uh, my point is that suicides happen on both ends. Not just during the depression, but quite often also during the manias. And this has been the case of um, the kernel of the crisis, which, which is the United States, and perhaps a little bit your uh, situation as well. It wasn't, uh, you know, first comes the economic slowdown and then come all the troubles. No, it was a sun, as much as I remember, was a, the sun was up, unemployment was low, your productivity was high, very high impressive levels of efficiency, banking scores um, were quadruple A, and, and, and uh, uh, I mean, that also speaks a little bit about the mania when we actually use triple A's um, uh, to grade. We don't do that in schools, <laughs> but it had to be triple A. Uh, and then came the bankruptcy. And after that, we saw the slowdown. So it was a, what I call a full throttle bankruptcy. And this is, I think, the kernel of the crisis. The Greek problem is the easy case. I mean, there, of course, everybody knows what to do. We don't know how to implement it, but it is not a problem intellectually. A a, a Dutch politician said once very well, uh, you know, it is not that we politicians are stupid. We know exactly what to do. What we don't know is how to be re-elected after doing it. And, and, and this is sort of the, the Greek problem, let's call it a, a democratic problem, of how to, w- within a spoiled democracy that is used to receiving how to actually administer pain. Uh, uh, so, you know, when you read the newspapers, in between the lines we sort of read, you know, if only the Greeks worked twice as much and paid their taxes twice as efficiently, they wouldn't have a problem. This is sort of not politically correct, but that's sort of what you, what you read. Now, isn't the Irish problem exactly the opposite? I mean, if Irish, especially bankers, would work half the time, you wouldn't have a problem. <laughs> and uh, There are some bankers in the room. I am a banker. I am a banker myself. I, uh, that, this is why I can afford, I hope, to make fun of them. Of, of us. I would never dare to make fun of anything else except for my own profession. Uh, so, you know, trying to, you know, deal just, just with depression is not helpful when you are faced with a manic depressive patient. Like it is not helpful to just deal with hangovers when you are confronted with an alcoholic. Because hangovers are not the problem. I mean, to, to an alcoholic, hangovers would seem 
to be the problem. But anybody who has a sober sort of, you know, distance from it will know that the problem is not the Saturday morning. The problem was the Friday afternoon or evening or, or morning. Depends how, <laughs> how professional one gets in, you know, in these, uh, in these things. Uh, so to a manic depressive patient, you do not administer... Uh, antidepressants, you administer mood stabilizers. And this is something that we have forgotten as economists. The role of an economist, and I will conclude with this so that we have a lot of time for debate, the role of an economist was never to increase GDP growth. Never, ever. The role of an economist is to stabilize or decrease the amplitude of a business cycle, which inevitably, if the economy is doing well, means more, I mean, it, well, it basically means that you should be actually decreasing GDP growth on, in many years. And that is something that we've completely, completely forgot. Thank you for your attention.